Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. Um, where we left off last time was looking at the spectrophotometer system we were going to build, and we had divided uh, our system into things that were electronic, optical, or, or combined elements of both. And you remember that um, essentially electrical power gave electrons E to a light source. The light source converted electrons to photons, which we represent as H nu, which are filtered. H nu comes out of that and goes through the sample. And this sample is really the thing we want to determine what it is. It's the thing we want to measure and learn something about by building this optical system. So we have an input of photons into our sample and an output of photons out of our sample that have been changed in some way by interaction with the sample. And these are again filtered, go to the detector and make electrons and then go to electronics. But today we're going to be focusing on the sample and some of the basic properties of material that allows interaction with light. And this is going to be at a very basic level, uh, since this really is a graduate topic. Um, so all of you are familiar with this idea of the Bohr atom, with a nucleus and a, a cloud of electrons surrounding it. We know it doesn't really look like this, um, but this is a fairly good representation. We also know that, um, depending on the type of atoms, the electrons in the inner shells uh, which are shown as these green fuzzy dots here are filled. And there are a lot of outer energy levels, uh, energy levels three, four, and so on, that are not filled, that the electrons can jump to if they get some energy. And the form of energy that they get is, is essentially a photon. Um, and the way we represent this Bohr atom diagrammatically is the, the ground energy level zero and a bunch of other energy levels that are not occupied. And this is the tricky part. Um, because the lowest energy level, E0, is in fact the outer fill shell of our atom. It's the one that the electrons take the least energy to bump up to other levels. The inner shells we hardly deal with at all. And that means the first unoccupied level is level 3, but we represent it as the level 1 there, and so on and so forth. Um, we also know that these electrons sort of jiggle around and move um, in a very random fashion in these orbitals. And you'll notice that this electron then is in the ground energy level. And if we were to bring a photon in, let's say some kind of photon coming in and interacting with this electron, we would jump the energy up to a higher level like that. And that's represented by the electron here um, going up to the next higher level and then being there and not being there anymore. Um, and that's what we've just done. Uh, we know that while the electron is jumping from E0 to E1, it's in both states simultaneously, but that's the subject of a future mini-lecture. We also know that this is a good picture in a, a atom in the vacuum of free space, but it's not good in a liquid where you have these, these molecules sort of randomly arranged and that the, the spacing between these is, is changing over time and is very variable. So the environment each atom finds itself in it is not the perfect well-defined energy levels like you have here. Also, if you embed these atoms in solid materials, the atoms of the solid interact with the atom that we're looking at and cause a large perturbation to these energy levels. And what that essentially corresponds with is that um, rather than energy levels, you have energy bands um, so that the first energy level is a range of possible energies, so is the second and third energy level. And even this ground energy level, the one that will be populated with electrons at room temperature, is a range of energies. And, and we don't write um, these in terms of these dark lines, because that's very difficult to do unless you have a graphics program. We represent the energy levels something like this, where there is a certain probability of being in a given state that has kind of a Gaussian shape to it. And so we have certain probabilities of electrons being in states with, with this being the most probable energy an electron will be at. But because of this variation in the environment or molecules or atoms bumping into each other, the energies vary around a little bit with, with deviations from that peak. Certainly possible. Um, and so essentially what we have is either, in this case, an electron going from an upper energy level to a lower energy level and emitting a photon, or we could certainly have an electron that would start at a lower energy level and absorb a photon, H nu, coming in. Um, let's go ahead and write H nu there, ending up in this upper level. But equally possible are electrons that go from this point to this point at longer wavelengths, or this point to this point 
at, at, at shorter wavelengths or more energetic wavelengths. And so essentially what that corresponds with is that when electrons are, or excuse me, when photons are absorbed, the photons come in and give their energy up, um, depending on the energy of the photon, they can raise an electron to energy level E1, E2, or E3, but this transition right here to a place where there was no energy level would not be allowed. Notice the probability of the electron being here is zero, so it simply can't go there. And what we would observe in fact, if we did an experiment and shine light of many different colors uh, through a material that had these energy levels, is we would find when the spacing between the energy levels um, did not match one in which they could be absorbed, the transmission is going to be 100%. All the light is going to get through. But at short wavelengths or high energies, and remember, wavelength and energy are inversely related, uh, we would see some absorption or light being absorbed as the energy of the photons went to raise electrons to this high energy level, that then drops off, but we see the similar thing at the green line right here at a different wavelength. And so essentially by shining light through our sample and looking at the colors that are being absorbed and looking at where these peaks are, we get essentially a fingerprint of where these energy levels lie, and that can help us identify materials. And uh, as we'll see in a little bit, the photon or the probability of a photon interacting with an atom um, i.e. being absorbed or emitted, depends on the number of things it can interact with, um, the number per unit volume, and also what's called the cross-section. And think of this as just the probability of it hitting it. Um, certainly, you get the same type of situation when you have electrons dropping from higher energy level to lower energy levels. Um, in this case, light's being emitted, and the light emitted is zero unless it happens to correspond to an energy in which the the probability of an electron being somewhere and being somewhere else is, is equal to this energy. And we get a series of lines of emitted light um, that look like this. And you'll notice that the absorption and fluorescence are offset a little bit. Fluorescence is red shifted to longer wavelengths than the absorption, which tends to be blue shifted to shorter wavelengths. And this is due to the fact that, that generally electrons rapidly drop in energy within these bands before they have a chance to drop down. And so we tend to see this, this uh, uh, red shift of fluorescence and blue shift of absorption. And we'll look into the mechanisms of absorption and fluorescence in the next mini-lecture.